Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ms. McGuire online video lecture. And today we're covering the reproductive system female. So I already recorded the video that covered a male reproductive system. So I will leave the link in the description section so you can watch both. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin. So female reproductive anatomy. Female reproductive system is made of ovaries that are female gonads. They produce gametes that we call ova. Well, sometimes you call them eggs, right? But actually, ova would be uh, the appropriate term to use. Also, ovaries secrete female sex hormones such as estrogen and progesterone. So those are primary organs of the female reproductive system. Then we have accessory organs that include uh, internal genitalia. Um, well, because it's include ovaries, we can say that's a primary organ. But accessory organs is um, part of duct system and include uterine tubes. We used to call them fallopian tubes, uterus and vagina. Right, those are internal genitalia and external genitalia, external sex organs. Now, what are those organs? We will look at these organs um, later in this chapter. Uh, so if you look at this mid-sagittal section of female reproductive system, you can see uterus that is in, located inside pelvic cavity vagina, right, external genitalia, uterine tube or fallopian tube, and ovary. Right. Also, please uh, note that anterior to the vagina, we have urinary bladder and urethra, and posterior to vagina, you would find a rectum, anal canal, and anus. Each ovary is held in place by several ligaments, uh, including ovarian ligament that anchors ovary medially to uterus. So here's uterus, ovary, and this is ovarian ligaments and a suspensory ligament that is part of broad ligament that supports uterine tubes, uterus, and vagina. All right, so here we have uh, the suspensory ligament. And this um, large ligament over here, shown in kind of yellow color, that's a broad ligament. Blood supply for ovaries. We have ovarian arteries and ovarian branch of uterine arteries. So let's look at the blood vessels here. So that's our abdominal aorta. Ovarian arteries branch from abdominal aorta. And we have uterine arteries that branch from internal iliac artery Right. And they have the uh, ovarian branches. So that's a uterine artery. And then we have ovarian branches. Vessels travel through suspensory ligament. Right. So here's our ovarian artery travels through the suspensory ligament. And a mesovaria, that is this part of the broad ligament. Each ovary surrounded by fibrous tunica albuginea. If you remember, testes are surrounded by tunica albuginea as well, which is then covered by germinal cuboidal epithelium, that is outer layer. Germinal layer is continuation of peritoneum. So if you look at the ovary over here, at the surface of the ovary, you will find this germinal epithelium that is simple cuboidal. And then deep to it is tunica albuginea, that is connective tissue. 
Now, if you look at the ovary, they have two poorly defined regions. Outer cortex, that will be, um, you know, all this area here, so it's shown. So that's a cortex that houses forming gametes, right? gametes that are our ova, and inner medulla that you will find um, vessels and nerves in that region. So here's our inner medulla. Avarian follicles. Now, where these follicles are located? So if you go back, at this histology slide, you will see in the cortex, those kind of like circular structures, those are ovarian follicles. They contain immature egg or oocyte that is uh, surrounded by follicle cells. Now, when follicle grows and those so we're gonna start, when we start with pr uh, primordial follicle, we have only one layer of these follicle cells, making like a little sac, right? But when we start having several layers of follicle cells, we call them granulosa cells. So follicular cells become granulosa cells. So here you can see a follicle and those uh, cells shown here in blue color, those are granulosa cells. Um, then the follicle is covered by other um, layers called cica interna and cica externa, right? So, um, so that's a covering of the follicle, external covering. But when we're talking about follicle cells, they're um, the same as granulosa cells. Follicles go through several stages of development. Uh, we as females are born with primordial follicles. That is a single layer of follicle cells plus oocyte. More mature follicles um, have several layers of granulosa cells plus oocyte. So the egg or oocyte is located inside structure called follicle. Follicle is made of cells. The cells that make follicle are called follicle cells, that makes sense, right? But when we start having several layers of these follicle cells, we call them granulosa cells, right? So when we're talking about primordial follicle, if it's a single layer of follicle cells and oocyte, then it's primordial follicle. If we have um, several layers of granulosa cells and oocyte, those are more mature follicles. Now, what are those more mature follicles? Um, that will be a, a group. So here you see that's our uh, primordial follicle or primary follicle, then follicle grows and became a, like a secondary follicle, a tertiary follicle. And then finally we get vesicular or antral. Or yeah, that's our tertiary follicle. It's a fully mature follicle and it has antrum or space inside the follicle. So you, you can see this is our primary follicle, secondary follicle, and then we start seeing spaces filled with fluid uh, inside the follicle. They unite together, forming antrum. Right now, this fluid-filled antrum is formed and follicle bulges. It bulges from the surface of the ovary. And uh, ovulation is ejection of oocyte from ripening, ripe, ripening follicle. So you see how follicle is changes here? And uh, finally, it's, um, it's uh, bulges from the surface. It has like a large antrum, right? So that's what we call mature follicle. And then the oocyte and protective cells covering oocyte is ejected from the follicle. And that's what we call ovulation. Now this uh, granulosa cells that were part of the follicle became now corpus luteum. So here's our empty follicle that turned into corpus luteum. Corpus luteum develops from 
uh, ruptured follicle after ovulation. And then uh, we have a um, slow regression of corpus luteum that takes uh, 14 days um, for it to, um, um, to be broken you know, apart and we don't have it anymore. So we already mentioned that ovaries are primary reproductive organs of uh, the female reproductive system, and then we have duct system that um, includes uterine tubes, uterus, and vagina. So uterine tube system does not have direct contact with ovaries. Um, so I don't know if you can see it over here or not, but... So you see that's a tube that's called ovarian tube. And um, right, and this is the ovary and there is a space between them. So there is no direct contact. Ovulated oocyte is cast into peritoneal cavity. That is pretty crazy, huh? So instead of just depositing this oocyte directly inside uh, fallopian tubes or ovarian tubes, and it can uh, move towards the uterus, it's ejected inside the cavity. Some oocyte never make it to tube system. And as I already said, this tube system include uterine tube, that's what we used to call fallopian tubes, uterus, and vagina. So uterine tubes, also called fallopian tubes or oviducts, receive ovulated oocyte and are usual site of fertilization. Oh, here we can see it better. So you see the uterus shown in green, our uterine tubes. And now look, see there is no direct connection. Right? So when uh, we have ovulation, oocyte ejected in a cavity, and then uh, the tubes, they have um, this uh, finger-like projections uh, called fimbria. So this fimbria uh, moves and creates a fluid current and picks up oocyte. Now tubes are 10 centimeters or four inches long and extend from area of ovary to uh, su super supralateral region of uterus. So it's a superior and lateral region of uterus. So superlateral. Region of uterine tube, um, we have isthmus. Now isthmus in anatomy means narrow part. It's constricted area where tube joins uterus, ampulla, and ampulla is um, the uh, dilated part. So it's distal end of tube that curves around ovary. Right, so here's our ampulla. And infundibulum, is this part here, distal expansion near ovary, contains ciliated fimbria that create current to move all side into uterine tube. All right, so again, we have isthmus, ampulla, then infundibular with fimbria. So fimbria is a part of infundibular. Uterus is hollow, thick walled muscular organ. Functions is to receive retain and nourish fertilized ovum. Now look, where fertilization happened? In fallopian tubes, right? So the uterus receives fertilized ovum, already fertilized ovum. Position of the uterus uh, include enteroverted and retroverted. Now enteroverted is a normal position. So let's look over here on this diagram and uh, let's orient ourselves. So this is anterior, that's a posterior. So rectum here and anus, vagina and urethra. 
So this is urinary bladder. And the normal position of the uterus is this one. So it's superior um, to the urinary bladder and it's bended anteriorly, right? So that's a normal position. If it's retroverted, then uh, it's inclined backwards. So you see over here, it's inclined backwards. Um, so this one, when it's completely inclined, then we call it retroflexed. Retroverted is kind of like in the middle, right? So either it most, um, uh, instead of um, inclined anteriorly, it more in a, a vertical position. That's retroverted or completely flexed, retroflexed. And you see what's happening if we don't have this normal position, because this is your uh, colon. Right, this is sigmoid colon, and uh, this is where you store feces um, before you um, go number two or defecate. And if it's retroflexed or even retroverted, you actually constrict your sigmoid colon. Um, another abnormal position is prolapsed. So here you can see how uterus is prolapsed through vagina. So you don't even see vagina over here because uterus now is in it, it kind of like inside vagina and it's, uterus can even uh, fall out of the pelvic cavity. So let's look at anatomy of the uterus. Region of uterus includes body, that is the main portion. So here's the body. Fundus, rounded superior region. Isthmus, remember isthmus is narrow part. It's narrow inferior region, right? So right there. And cervix, it's a narrow neck. There's the cervix, just inferior to isthmus. It's narrow neck or outlet that projects into vagina. So you see how vagina um, has this pouch called uh, phonix. So the cervix kind of projects into vagina. Cervical canal is inside the cervix and it's communicate with vagina through external os and with uterus through internal os. Supports of the uterus include several ligaments, uh, like mesometria. That's a lateral uh, support of broad ligament. So here's our broad ligament. Right? And uh, mesometria is this part, and it's also uh, on superior and inferior part of the uterus. So mesometrium is a part of broad ligament. Cardinal or lateral ligament from cervix and superior vagina to pelvic lateral wall. This is the one that is not shown on the um, on, on diagrams. Uterus sacral ligament, you can see on this diagram. So here's the uterus, and that's a pregnant female. And see how uterus connected to the sacrum? That's uterus sacral ligament and round ligament. So I like this diagram because you can really see what this round ligament is. So it extends through the um, lateral margins of the uterus, so it's from lateral side, through the inguinal canal to the external genitalia. Right, so that's a round ligament. Okay, so you, here you can look at the... Um, uh, ligaments again. So uh, ligaments are uh, folds of peritoneum, right? So here's our anterior, posterior side, and what's shown here in green, that's our peritoneum. So it covers the uterus and tubes, uterine tubes and uh, ovaries, right? So that's a modification of peritoneum. And uh, yeah, and you can see that's a broad ligament made of mesometrium over here. Then we have a uh, meso-ovarian right there, mesosalpnix. Those are three parts of broad ligament. 
then um, the other ligament you can see here will be uh, ovarian ligament that connects ovary to a lateral wall of the uterus. Uh, uterus sacral, remember it connects uterus to the posterior wall. That's our round ligament. Uh, uterus has, um, well, wall of uterus has three layers. Uh, we're going to start from superficial and we're going to move to deep layers. So perimetrium is out, outermost serous layer that is visceral peritoneum. Myometrium, it's a bulky middle layer consisting of interlacing layers of smooth muscles. Myo means muscle. And endometrium is uh, in, a layer inside. It's a mucosal lining made of simple columnar epithelium on top of thick lamina propria. Fertilized egg um, burrows into endometrium and resides there during development. So the uh, fertilized egg need to implant itself inside this endometrium, and that's where it will um, develop into uh, embryo and fetus. So if you see here, we have perimetrium. And so here's our perimetrium. Then we have, oh, I'm sorry. It's actually, it's just the layer, I think. Then we have myometrium and endometrium. Perimetrium is a very thin layer. I think, it, yeah, so it's, it's not this um, green part, it just shows us like arrow here. So it's just covering. And it's a um, it's really thin layer made of simple squamous epithelial tissue and um, areolar tissue, areolar connective tissue. Then myometrium that has several layer of muscles and endometrium. Endometrium has two chief layers or strata. Now, so we're looking at this internal part, right? Endometrium. So here's your portion of myometrium, that is your smooth muscle. And here's our endometrium. So it's made of a stratum functionalis or functional layer. So that's a stratum functionalis. And stratum basalis, this one, or basal layer. Uh, changes in stratum functionalis happens in response to a variant hormone cycles. So this stratum functionalis is change, changes, depends on hormones uh, secreted by your pituitary gland. And stratum functionalis is shed during menstruation. Stratum basalis or basal layer forms new, forms new stratum functionalis after menstruation and unresponsive to a variant hormone. So hormones do not affect structure of stratum basalis. Um, uterine arteries supply blood to uterus and they arise from internal iliac arteries and they branch into arcuate arteries first. So let's, let's look over here. So we have our uterine arteries and then we have arcuate arteries that became radial arteries. And the radial arteries are in uh, myometrium, um, right? So that's our myometrium. And then when they reach endometrium, they branch into straight arteries in stratum basalis and spiral arteries in the stratum functionalis. And then, of course, they, um, they uh, split into small capillaries. Right, so we have uterine artery, arcuate artery, uh, because they look like arches. Then we have radiate arteries, and radiate arteries breaks into straight or spiral or coiled. And coiled um, move to the stratum functionalis. Now those um, uh, spiral arteries, they spasm, and this, uh, so just be before 
you have your uh, menstruation, um, those arteries spasm that causes shedding of functionalis layer during menstruation. So if they spasm, you don't deliver enough uh, blood to um, this all this tissue here, and that the tissue dies and you shed it during menstruation. Vagina is a thin walled tube that is about three, four inches in length, function as birth canal, passageway for menstrual flow and organ for copulation. Extends between bladder and rectum from cervix to exterior. So vagina is, let, let me, let me go back to, to the slide to show you uh, where vagina is located. Oh, that's the next one, by the way. All right, so let's go um, to the next slide. And you can see that vagina, that's this structure here. So it's between urinary bladder and rectum. Uh, anterior to vagina is urethra. Posterior to vagina is uh, ana, anal canal and anus. Right, so that's what it says. It extends between bladder and rectum from cervix to exterior, and urethra runs parallel to vagina anteriorly. Right, so, um, so again, it extends from the cervix to the exterior, and urethra runs parallel to vagina, but on anterior side. Now, external genitalia is also called vulva or um, pudendum. And it includes mons pubis, that is fatty area of a lying pubic symphysis, labia majora, hair covered, fatty skin folds, and it's a counterpart of male uh, scrotum. So here, labia majora. So imagine if this labia majora was fused together, that would form scrotum. So it's a homologous part. Labia minora, skin folds lying within labia majora. So here's labia minora. And vestibule is a recess within labia minora. So that's, that's a vestibule. Um, we have greater vestibular glands that homologous to bulba urethral glands and release mucus into vestibule for lubrication. Um, right, so here, um, um, so here's our uh, pubic symphysis in the middle, right? This is your hip bone, that's your another hip bone. And um, this is your genital diaphragm. Right, so you can see the um, clitoris over here. Um, that's um, the opening of the urethra, and this is the vagina, right? And posterior and lateral to vaginal opening, you have this greater vestibular gland that secrete mucus. Now, clitoris is anterior to vestibule, so here's the clitoris, and it's a counterpart of penis. So it's a homologous structure to a penis. Perineum is diamond-shaped region between pubic arch and coccyx. So that's that's area over here. It's called perineum. The same as in uh, male. Uh, um, on a, a, we cover perineum in male anatomy. Now mammary glands, a modified sweat glands, consist of. 15 to 25 lobes. Now, how those lobes are formed? Um, so we have this uh, suspensory ligament that attaches breast to underlying muscle, and it makes this scepter between the glands, between this um, uh, alveoli, and it's divide breast into lobules. So here you see those lobules. So we have 15 to 25 lobules. Areola is pigmented skin surrounding um, nipple. It's areola. Um, so let's um, 
let's go back because I like this diagram um, better. So let me pick up my pen again. And you see we have um, like, um, so this is one lobule. So one, one lobule uh, made of um, simple cuboidal cells. Those are epithelial milk secreting cells. And then the product or milk is deposited uh, in the, this lumen of a lobule and in the duct. Right, so here we have a uh, here we have a milk duct. All right, so um, so here you see the uh, the flow of a product or milk from um, alveoli inside the lobule. Right, so through the uh, duct, through the uh, sinuses into the uh, nipple. But on a on the next on the next picture. We can see um, the rest of the structure over here. Right, so um, so we have uh, this is our lobule, right, and um, inside the lobule we have alveoli that have their own ducts, milk duct, and they um, became a lactiferous duct. So that's a lactiferous duct that empty in lactiferous sinus, and then opening of the lactiferous duct is inside the nipple. So lobules within lobes contain uh, glandular alveoli that produce milk. So this alveoli, this is where milk is uh, produced, right? So those um, like alveoli of your lungs, right? The same name, but of course, different function. Milk is passed through lactiferous duct into lactiferous sinuses that opens to outside at nipple. In non-nursing women, glandular structure is undeveloped. Breast size is due to amount of fat deposit. So you can see all this shown here, like this yellow structures here, that's adipose tissue. And the, uh, um, the, the glands, memory glands are actually the structure that are surrounded by fat. So let's let's go back uh, over here again. So we can see our one lobule. Inside we have those alveoli, right? So here's the, uh, here's the lobule. I, I constantly need to move some over here. So here's a, here's a lobule that made of um, this alveoli and um, those cells of alveoli produce milk and it flow to um, lactiferous duct, lactiferous sinuses and open up in inside a nipple. Okay, now breast cancer is invasive uh, cancer. Most common malignancy and the second most common cause of cancer deaths in US uh, women. So it's interesting that uh, prostate cancer is the second most common cause of cancer in a man and the breast cancer is the second most common cause of cancer in women. Now, 13% will uh, of females will develop breast cancer, a very scary number. So let's look at breast cancer stages um, that, um, that is used. So we use this um, classification to determine the choice of treatment um, and um, the diagnosis. So here's stage zero. The tumor size is very small. It's less than two centimeters and it's inside the glands. There is no cancer in lymph nodes. There is no spreading. The cancer confined to the breast area, not outside. And um, this is called extracellular vesicles, um, th those are markers 
for cancer uh, metastasis. So we have a negative EV. And five years survival rate is 100%. That means that all women who are diagnosed with breast cancer stage zero will be alive after five five years after diagnosis, right? So for example, you know somebody, right? They go to a doctor and they're diagnosed with breast cancer stage zero. That means they're not going to die in the next five years, right? That's a really, really good. Stage one, again, tumor size is small. It's um, less than two centimeters, no cancer in lymph nodes. It's confined to the breast area, not outside, negative EV. And again, 100% of all females who diagnosed with breast cancer stage one will survive five years. Now, Stage two, it's a, a bigger tumor, two to five centimeters. Now look, lymph nodes already affected by cancer. However, the cancer still only inside the breast, not outside. We have still negative uh, EV and 87% of female will survive five years, right? So we can see that, um, 13% of females will die before the five years after diagnosis, right? Stage three, five centimeters and larger and tumor size. Lymph nodes are affected by cancer and cancer has reached the muscles and skin but it's still only in the breast area. So it affects muscle and skin in the breast area and it affects lymph nodes. Uh, we still have negative EV and survival rate is 61%. So that means 61% only will survive five years after diagnosis. If it's stage cancer four, the tumor side doesn't really matter. We, uh, they don't measure the tumor side, but what we're looking at is that lymph nodes are affected by cancer and cancer has spread outside the breast area to any part of the body. You know, uh, that's what we call metastasis, right? This is metastasis as well, but they are still confined within the breast area. When here we might have metastasis in a, for example, in a, in in a bone, and it's actually very often that breast cancer will spread to pelvic bones. We have um, elevation of EV, and twenty percent only uh, will have five years survival rate. What it tell us that it's extremely extremely important to diagnose breast cancer earlier before it spreads to other parts of the body, right? So risk factors include early onset of menstruation and late menopause, no pregnancies or first pregnancy late in life, no or short period of breastfeeding, family history of breast cancer. 70% of women with breast cancer have no known risk factors and only 10% due to hereditary defects, including mutation in genes BRCA1 and BRCA2. Now, a female who have mutation in these genes, they have 50 to 80% chance to develop breast cancer. And they have greater risk of ovarian cancer as well. And the screening for uh, mutation, BRCA and BRCA2 mutation up uh, provided at the clinics. Now, how to diagnose uh, breast cancer? So early detection via self-examination and mama mammography. Um, so what is this mammogram? It's an X-ray examination. So American Cancer Society recommends screening every year for women 40 and over uh, and U.S. Prevention Service Task Force on Breast Cancer Screen recommends um, 
for female uh, 50 and over, right? So uh, I think in California, um, even at age, I think at age 30, right? And definitely at age 40, um, you can have mammogram every year and your insurance will pay for it. Okay, but let's look at self-examinations. This is what you can do before taking your mammogram. So here's the most common sign. Pain in one spot that does not go away. Swelling, warmth, redness, or darkening of the breast. Changing in the size or shape of the breast. And it's not necessary your breast will get larger. Very often, breast that is affected by cancer will get smaller. Dimpling and uh, puckering of the skin. Itchy, scaly sore or rash on the nipple. Nipple discharge that starts suddenly. Pulling in of the nipple or other part of the breast. And lump, hard knot or thickening inside the breast or underarm area. And um, here's our breast cancer treatment that they depend upon characteristics of lesion. We can use radiation, uh, chemotherapy, surgery, surgery often followed by radiation or chemotherapy to destroy stray cells. Uh, we also use drugs for estrogen responsive cancer. So here's some surgical uh, procedure that include from um, uh, most invasive to least invasive. So radical mastectomy. And radical doesn't mean you're gonna use radiation, okay? Because many students, when they see here radical mastectomy means, oh, we're gonna use radi uh, radiation. No, you can use radiation after all of the surgical procedure. Radical means you remove a lot. It removes breast, all underlying muscles, fascia, and associated lymph nodes. Simple mastectomy removes only breast tissue, sometimes some axillary lymph nodes. And lumpectomy, and lump is just a lump, right? Lump. So it just removes the lump, just a tumor. So it excises um, only cancerous lump, only tumor. Some uh, patients have breast reconstruction after surgical um, treatment. And here's the mammogram that is X-ray um, that uh, produces a film of breast tissue. So that's a normal breast. And this is film of breast with tumor that show malignancy. Okay, and I think this was our last slide for today's lecture, right? Um, thank you very much for watching. Now, if you watch it till the very end, you, of course, my hero, because I know those are long lectures. So if, please, if you have any questions or comments, just let me know, just leave your comments uh, in the comment section for this video. And um, thank you for watching, and I hope it was helpful.